Uh, well, good morning and welcome to today's webinar um, titled What Should We Teach Our Children About Money? Uh, with Matthew Leach uh, from Southampton Business School. Um, I'm Mike Wardle. I'm here to chair the session. So my job really is to uh, introduce, do some housekeeping and then uh, fade into the background uh, to the, give the floor to, to Matthew. Um, but first of all, uh, just some, some thanks to you. First of all, to our sponsors, we are very fortunate to have uh, a range of sponsors who uh, sponsor this series of webinars and allow us to um, range across uh, the fields of economics, finance, technology, science, and uh, other things that we and you find interesting. Um, the program for today is uh, relatively simple. Uh, my job, as I said, is to introduce and get out of the way. Then we'll hear from Matthew, um, who has been doing some thinking about uh, financial education um, and you know, is going to present to us uh, some of that thinking. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. The session is being recorded. Um, if uh, you, you know, want to look again or you find it interesting enough to share with friends and colleagues, um, then the recording will be up on our website uh, in a couple of days. Uh, secondly, um, there's going to be a Q&A session um, after Matthew's presentation. Uh, for those of you who haven't used GoToWebinar before, the way that you uh, pose a question is on the dashboard on your screen, you'll see a question tab. You can type in your thoughts uh, there, uh, comments, questions, observations, um, and I'll field those uh, when we go into the Q&A session at the end of Matthew's presentation. Um, so Matthew, we're very much looking forward um, to your presentation this morning. Um, as I mentioned, you are a visiting lecturer at Southampton Business School, um, quite, dealing quite a lot with um, other topics other than this one, um, um, but really with us today to share some of your thinking um, about financial education and where we're going. So Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start my slides. Is it working? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Hopefully, you can see the slides. Yes, yeah, so thanks very much indeed. And thank you for the opportunity to share some information and some ideas with you all. Uh, I first got interested in this because of something completely unrelated. I was researching something else. I was, and that required me to um, debate topical issues with random people online uh, on social media. And this included uh, vaccination during the COVID period, some religious topics, identity politics, and also money and the economy. And I found, uh, of course, many people with strange misconceptions that, uh, in a sense, uh, were worrying because that. Those misconceptions implied that they themselves were disadvantaged by their misunderstandings, but also that their behavior would undermine the system as a whole. And in vaccination, of course, that's do you want to get vaccinated or not? But with money, there were also some other interesting issues. One person said to me that uh, they wrote to me that if uh, that it was immoral to charge people money for food, and that if I didn't understand that, I was part of the problem. Well, I started to think about this and what could be done about these misconceptions and that led me to this topic of what should we teach our children about money as i got into it i found it to be more interesting than i had realized at first and i hope that during this webinar you'll have a similar feeling so an overview at my agenda then um, first i'm going to start with an overview of my conclusions so there won't be surprises of this then I'll give you some information. I'm going to go back and give you some information about what's currently done to teach about money in UK schools. Then outline some opportunities for improvement on what's currently done. Then talk about truth and controversy. This is about the problem of talking about money when it's such a politicised topic. Almost nobody knows what it sounds like to talk about money without it getting political. And finally, I'll very briefly mention my ideas for a curriculum. So an overview, I think this topic is relevant to schools, obviously, but also to parents who want to help their children and to students themselves who could, after all, teach themselves. There are opportunities to expand the scope. Um, and this would be not just for the students benefit, but also if people know better how to participate in our economy, then I think our economy should work better. There's also an opportunity to protect people, young people from manipulative rhetoric. Uh, just using basic factual knowledge. Through this, there's a recurring theme that 
that long-term cooperative economic relationships involving money are important, something we should cultivate. Also, this talk is really just an introduction to a much longer document that I wrote, I've written over the last uh, several months, um, and it will be available after this webinar in PDF and EPUB 2 formats. Probably I will make some changes in response to what uh, you guys um, type to me as questions and comments at the end. So some background on what's taught today. There has been a growing interest in what's called financial education. Um, this is across many countries and academic publications in this area have been increasing exponentially. That is literally exponentially, not just quickly. Back in 2014, uh, in the UK, there was a curriculum change, a, curriculum, a national curriculum change. Two bullet points were added. The impact of this has been checked by running surveys on what children remember about uh, their their education at school, and this shows that this change had very little impact uh, on on children. And after an initial bit of excitement, rather than building, the impact seems to have slightly faded away. And perhaps in response to this, that's why there's been renewed efforts over the last maybe two or three years by schools, charities, and campaigners. There's a, a group that's produced some PSHE guidance. This is for uh, personal social health and economic guidance. It's sort of like a curriculum, really. Um, there's lots of people providing teaching materials. There's guidance for covering financial education. And there's a textbook heavily funded, uh, subsidized by Martin Lewis, the TV money guru. Throughout this material, the focus tends to be on personal finance from a selfish point of view. So it's just what's, what's good for the individual consumer of um, perhaps finance services. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to go beyond that, that perspective and beyond personal finance and small financial decisions, also to include some simple economics. So not charts and theories and so on, which uh, history has shown tends to be difficult for many students to turn into practical application, but just some very simple ideas about how money and the economy works. Three major areas for potential improvement. Personal decisions with positive contributions to society and our economy. Secondly, I think we can reduce vulnerability to political agitation uh, and willingness to behave in ways that weaken our economy. Like the crazies on, online that I met uh, in the last couple of years. And finally, vulnerability to fraud, where what's done is already quite good. There's just a couple of little gaps. Overall, I think our economy should work better if more people know how to behave within it. So starting with personal decisions and positive contributions to the economy, uh, as I mentioned, the existing materials do tend to focus on the self-interest of the student and often in quite a, um, an immediate and direct way. It doesn't mention, for example, the role of money in facilitating cooperation. And doesn't mention the idea that doing useful things for others is the key to getting a job, having a career and having enough money to enjoy life. This, I think, is actually quite uh, interesting because the national curriculum and PSHE guidance generally is very keen to tell students how to be good citizens. There's lots of pro-social messages in there. It's just when they turn to money, that stops. So here's a snippet from my suggested curriculum to just give an idea of how cooperation might be talked about. Uh, under the heading of why money is useful, we're naturally a cooperative species and thrive on it. A very simple economic point. We specialize in exchange. Money builds on the reciprocity instinct, that is cooperation. It's an accounting method that fa for favors done for people, makes reciprocity more exact. It enables reciprocity to be, well, you probably know the rest, uh, it's the usual sort of economic points about why money is useful. But if we start with cooperation, I think it's a little bit more accessible. Here's another snippet. How to manage money through your life. Firstly, seek work, paid or unpaid, that helps others. Do your fair share of the work needed for our lives. Don't waste money or real resources such as time, water, energy, food. Even small daily savings of money and real resources accumulate over a lifetime. And finally, try to build a financial reserve early for a smoother life. Save for retirement if you can. 
actually the existing curriculum and teaching materials do have quite a lot on saving. Um, it's one of the stronger areas. But a lot of the other points on this slide don't really get a feature. Now turning to vulnerability to political agitation. There's some evidence that young people are more vulnerable to this than older people. Um, Clemens and Globeman in, uh, published in 2023, but I think they did the survey in 2022. They asked people of different ages if uh, particular economic systems were ideal. So people, if they thought a system was ideal, they would say yes to this. And compared to older respondents, young people more often agreed that particular economic systems were ideal. And they said this of uh, capitalism, uh, but also socialism, and also communism, and also fascism. So in a sense, it doesn't matter which system you ask them about, young people are, a higher proportion of young people will say, yes, that's ideal. Older people seem to have, uh, perhaps they're aware of more drawbacks. I suspect this reflects a lesser knowledge. What kind of dysfunctional behaviours could be prompted by political rhetoric uh, designed to, usually to get people feeling unhappy about the economy, but not always? Well, left-wing rhetoric may lead to resentment, poor personal decisions, um, being feeling aggressive and resentful. Vulnerability to right-wing rhetoric can lead to harsh economic behaviours, basically trying to rip people off, sharp practices, feeling if you can get away with it, if it's strictly legal, then it's okay. But that can lead to a selfish attitude that again leads to poor personal decisions that ultimately end up harming you. The little uh, picture at the below, below, by the way, shows a capitalist and you can recognize him because he's wearing a top hat and he's a little bit overweight. How do we counter this rhetoric? There's a number of things in the suggested syllabus, but one of the key things I think is to uh, talk about the degree of competition in economies because our economy is more cooperative than most people think um, and both the left and the right wing tend to think that the economy is more harshly competitive than it actually is. The left wingers think it's harshly competitive and that's a really bad thing. The right wingers think it's harshly competitive but that's great. They're both wrong. Our economy is typically not as harsh as that. Here's another snippet to give you an idea of the sort of thing I'm thinking of, why it is morally fine to get paid. Well, being employed for money involves a mutual agreement to cooperate. So again, we start with cooperation. Being paid for doing something lets you do more of it. You can't be a nurse uh, for free. If you're going to do nursing all day, you need to get something back so you can pay for the other things you need in life. Having more money means you have more influence and can use that for good. It's not necessarily that you're going to use more money to have an extravagant lifestyle or to in some way persecute people. Finally, as the three areas for improvement, vulnerability to fraud. Again, I, I think the syllabus actually covers this quite well and the, the textbook covers it quite well, but two simple points I think are missing. And one is that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is not true. Um, the role of greed in sucking you into a fraud scheme is not very well explained. And secondly, crypto tokens, which are very interesting to young people, but also rife with scams and frauds and just projects that have failed uh, through ignorance and lack of care. And, and those don't really get enough attention in the existing materials. Now moving on to the problem of politicization of this topic, truth and controversy. Teaching in this area must do three things. It must be factual, factually true and not misleading. This is not like presenting religions where you might say, well, here are some potentially equally valid faith systems. No, there is some truth, even if we don't know what it is. Second thing is it must avoid a negative bias. And by negative bias here, I mean that tendency that we have or people have of thinking the world is going to hell in a handbasket when in fact, decade on decade, things are generally getting better. And that's usually because of improved technology. So teachers should not try to be overly positive in order to counteract the negative bias. This should be objective and neutral, and they should point out that the negative bias exists. I think a lot of people who've maybe heard negative things about the economy 
would be surprised by the seemingly positive nature of an objective presentation. And finally, teaching must avoid loaded language, which is surprisingly difficult. Firstly, factual, using facts. Just as we can encourage people to get vaccinated by giving them facts about how vaccines work and how testing is done, uh, it should be possible to debunk some of the, the worst ideas by just giving facts. If we explain what banks and insurance companies do and why they're valued, why people will pay for their services, why society allows them to continue, that helps to uh, counter angry rhetoric that sees the city as some kind of scam to operate by an elite to persecute and exploit the rest of us. Another example is uh, people often have a very negative uh, association to the word profit. And partly that's due to not understanding what happens to the money that flows through a business. And if we simply explain the facts about this in across typical businesses, um, that's very useful. Uh, typically, money comes in, a lot of money comes in from customers. A lot of it goes out to suppliers, a lot more goes out to employees. A relatively tiny amount goes out as interest payments to lenders. Uh, again, a tiny amount to the government as corporation tax. And again, a tiny amount to shareholders. You basically get the leftovers or portion of the leftovers uh, at the end of all the accounting. Neutral language. This is one of my biggest interests actually in this topic. Um, so all of these terms here, except for one, are loaded in some way. Disadvantaged, deprived, underprivileged, with household income in the lowest decile, that's the neutral one, poor and sponges. Uh, deprived, for example, has the connotation that the person has a low income because somebody else has taken it away or taken something away from them. So it's an, it's an implication about the causes of somebody's low income. Sponges, I think, speaks for itself as a, as a bad term. Poor is slightly ambiguous. Are we saying that their finances are poor or that they are poor quality people and therefore in some way deserve to have a low income? So teaching needs to just pick and stick with the usually the technical and very neutral term defining exactly what we mean in each case. Another fascinating example of loaded language is the term socialism and capitalism which I didn't realize until relatively recently uh, were introduced or developed, the use of this, these terms were developed in the 1850s by left-leaning writers. And obviously there were many, there are always problems with the economy. There were many more back then. And the idea of calling the capitalist system capitalism was in order to load all the failings, all the, the negatives onto the shoulders of people who provided money to start businesses by buying shares to make capitalists somehow the evil ones. Uh, usually depicted today with as fat men with top hats. Socialism as a word sounds, well, just nicer. This has nothing to do with what actually happens when you try to implement versions of socialism, but it just sounds like a nicer thing. Now, as it happens, neither of these refers to a specific economic system. They're broad categories of system and the variety within socialism is particularly striking. What we have in the UK is uh, sometimes called a social market economy, which is a specific example of a system. It's not really a clear example of, of either. We have a welfare state, but we also heavily use uh, markets, which we regulate and control to a large extent, though usually we try to allow prices to move freely. So generally, it's better to avoid those terms, socialism and capitalism, completely. In teaching. So finally, uh, the curriculum is quite long. Um, it has five sections. The basics of work, money and markets, which I've mentioned the most. How to make good decisions. Businesses and their backers, that is investors, and the contributions of financial institutions and the government. Because remember, taxation is not theft. They do actually do something with the money. So in summary, I think compared to existing UK schemes, which incidentally are very good. If they were thoroughly implemented through all schools, it would be really very beneficial indeed. But even compared to that, there's still more that young people should know about money. Uh, there are plenty of factual points that can be made about the economy and the role of the individual person that will help them and also society as a whole.
promoting long-term cooperative economic relationships is a recurring theme and often a big part of that. So I hope I've encouraged you to read the detailed document that will be available in a couple of days um, when I processed your comments and made some modifications. Uh, so thank you in advance for those. I have some references, uh, just a few to get you started. And that's me for now, Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for um, that overview um, of your thinking so far. Um, and uh, for, for those who are interested, uh, once Matthew's updated the documentation, we'll make sure that goes onto the events page as one of the resources for this event. Um, and we look forward to that. Um, Paul Kay has asked, um, you know, have you looked at the core math syllabus taught at sixth form since around 2014 as part of the curriculum changes? Um, have you looked at it? And if you have, does that fit with your thinking in any way? Uh, that's a very good question. So I have not looked at the exact uh, A-level syllabus for since 2014 to look for changes. However, I am in fact in my spare time a maths tutor and I tutor maths A-level. Um, so I'm pretty aware of the, of the exact topics and techniques that are taught. Almost none of these is helpful uh, for being a better economic citizen. Uh, or make a bit, making better decisions. There is actually a module um, which I think most people don't study, but one of my sons did, which is on decision making. And it's based on core content from the operations research area. Weirdly, it did not explain the fundamentals of most decisions, which is that we compare the consequences of alternative courses of action. That simple point is not included in the syllabus, which I found to be uh, very strange. It's also, unfortunately, at least in the, in the Pearson version, which uh, was the one that my son did, the book itself was unusually poor by their standards. And I think that may also have hindered the adoption of it. So, it do, so there is some teaching which is possibly more related to practical decision making, but it's not used very often. And the book, at least a few years ago, was not, not very good. You're yeah, very, if, if you do A-level maths, you're going to be very good at modeling ladders leaning against rough walls on smooth floors um, and you'll be able to integrate curves of all sorts of interesting shapes but it won't actually make you a better economic citizen or help you to make better economic decisions. I really only learned that sort of stuff I mean, in myself in my own life when I became a trainee chartered accountant. Yeah I, th I think alongside maths A level I think there's now a core maths uh, program for sixth form students who are not doing maths A level and I think that's maybe where Paul was um, was focused. I've, so I've not heard of that. Uh, if, if somebody can give me some details, I'm trying to have a look. Yeah, yeah. Um, Clive Bullen um, asking about the rule of 72 um, and just whether you've come across it and whether it's something that is used to help children understand the risk of borrowing, the benefits of investing. Um, is that really I, well? I've not heard the rule of 72. Does any, can anybody tell, can Mike, can you tell me what the rule of 72 is? Um, I, I can't. Um, maybe, Clive, if you could put a note into the chat, um, that would be really helpful so we can uh, inform ourselves better. Um, I'm trying to remember if I've heard of something called the Rule of 78, which is an, an accounting thing to do with depreciation rates or something. But uh, no, please tell us what the Rule of 72 is. Well, if, if, if Clive, could, Clive could put a, uh, an extra comment into the question, that'd be really helpful. Uh, Jonathan Brill um, has mentioned Eduvate, uh, which is kind of a, a program focusing on online gamification uh, to improve financial literacy. Uh, and it kind of operates outside the formal education system. And just wondering whether you have any thoughts about how online education out of the formal education systems may fit into your thinking. Uh Again, I'm going to have to look at Eduvate, clearly. I haven't uh, seen this particular one. Right, so I have three sons who are all now um, men with beards, but they have been through some heavy game of phases. And I've read a fair bit about the, the idea of gamification as a way to try to uh, gain the attention of young people and to educate them. I don't really have a view on this particular thing. I know that actually Zyen has done quite a lot on educational um, sort of simulations and simulated markets. And uh, so probably that question will go to Michael Minelli very well. <laughs> and those of you who don't know, um, and those of you who are members of the FS Club, uh, if you sign into the club room on our website, you'll find uh, a game called Ecstasy. 
uh, where you can um, to, you can trade in effect um, you know, between different countries. Um, so you invest in, in countries, uh, buy and sell shares in those countries. Um, so do take a look uh, if you get the chance. Uh, go to the club room uh, on our website. Um, Ian Harris um, has said thank you very much. A fascinating uh, presentation. Um, he says he's always felt that all people, both young and old, find it hard to uh, make intertemporal decisions, um, either to defer short-term spending or um, whatever. And the younger we are, the less attractive deferral seems, obviously, um, because of the uh, inherent uncertainty about the time value of money over long periods. Um, and he's just wondering whether an element of life learning or lifetime learning is required here to help people top up their financial literacy as they get older and their circumstances change and their thoughts move more into the future. That sounds like a very uh, good idea, Ian. Thank you for that. I mean, I was bracing myself for a question from somebody who's actually written a book about economics. <laughs> uh, one of the points you, you, you saw when I, I gave this snippet, which is about uh, managing your money through life, I was talking about uh, getting a job and, and so on. I think it's likely to be very helpful to talk to particularly children and as they get through teenagers a lot more about how their life will change as they get older mm. the different phases of life and also how that works with money um, and particularly ideas you wouldn't discuss this in an abstract formal way but the idea of, of uh, smoothing out your um, your consumption so we're more likely to borrow when we're young so that we can start to consume at a, so like a comfortable level. Then we'll have a middle pay period in our life when we're so productive, we're doing loads of things that for ourselves, but other people as well, our income builds up, we build up savings and then we reach retirement and gradually work our way through the money going on cruises or whatever people do when they're, reti when they're retired. And that's, that would be a useful concept to get over and just generally more about how things will change as you get older. Um, I've noticed certainly my, my children have, a, when they were younger especially, have a very short-term perspective. Um, Ian's point about updating the education as we go through life is an excellent one. I think experience has, update, has changed my son's perspectives. As they, as they hit each new phase of trying to get that job, the first career job, you know, and then trying to think, oh, where am I going to live? And can I, will I ever be able to afford to buy somewhere? Um, yeah, life is teaching them a bit, but uh, it would be a good idea to come back to it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Paul Kay has come back on the core maths uh, issue at sixth form, um, saying it's obviously very different from maths A-level and includes a lot of real-world financial material. Um, and generally uh, taken by students who don't want to do maths A-level, but want to do some maths post-GCSE. So I don't think it's compulsory. Um, that, that, sounds, really, that sounds um, actually but, terrific. That sounds terrific. Though I don't see why people who are good at maths and like it should have to study uh, abstract stuff that's not as useful as that. I um, would feel quite jealous, actually. I was good <laughs> at maths at school. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're good at maths at school, of course, you're, you're shuffled into pure maths as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> uh, but Paul also asks, um, he, he says, first of all, the great ideas. Um, he does wonder who is going to teach it, um, and how do you adapt to different attainment levels and ages? Um, in other words, is, is there a kind of a graded curriculum here? I haven't tried to do that. No, um, I haven't tried to do that. The the grading over time, the uh, published uh, materials and suggested syllabuses for PSHE and uh, um, citizenship and so on that have come out have done that quite well. Um, so I guess the task would be to try to figure out at what age you, you can introduce these these things. Thank you. Um, Edward Crouch is making more of an observation, but also I think a question. Um, he's saying if you do study economics A-level, you kind of get the money bit. And you, if you study history A-level, you get the socialism, capitalism, philosophical context. Um, but he, he thinks the real point of what you're proposing is to get a financial context into the bloodstream of all students at an earlier stage and age. Is that really where, we're, where you're focused? Uh, yes, I think so. I think it would be, uh, it would be quite useful. There are countries where, where, where more is done. Um, there's a region of Germany quite recently that's introduced compulsory a economic education. So this is a bit more than just uh, the, the personal finance side. 
I haven't looked at the materials. I suspect that they're probably in German, but I've seen a paper reviewing the impact of that uh, quite recently. Um, so Clive Bullen has come back on the rule of 72. It says that oh. the, if you borrow at a certain percent, you'll have to pay back double in 72 X years. So a 6% borrowing will require twice as much to be paid back in 12 years. Um, and I don't think this is something which is generally taught to children about how interest works and how repayment works and how to make decisions around that. But just wonder whether you have any thoughts. Uh, no, but you know, the, one of the most useful things to, to learn when you're young these days is how to use a spreadsheet. Um, I, I appreciate that poses practical difficulties for schools because you need equipment and classrooms to do that. But uh, it's just, if, if it's not a spreadsheet, then there'd be some kind of software. In my tutoring, one of the things I often find is that kids are not very motivated about uh, about maths. Um, where does algebra fit in? Well, the skill of a skill of algebra is the skill of writing a formulae. And so I show them what that looks like in the modern world in, in an actual job, which is it usually looks like a formula on a spreadsheet program or in some code somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that does make it more interesting for some. And you um, personally just posed the problem, I think, that you know, currently the gig economy is, you know, is part of the, the economy we have. The growing numbers employed in this area and you know, traditional career and earnings paths really don't exist for you know, this group of people. Oh, um, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think I think behind that comment is that you know we are uh, perhaps assuming some of the um, old ways of doing things and you get you get a job and you get a house and you get these things are going to be the future, but increasingly they're not looking so certain. Um, how does that play into you know, your thoughts on the curriculum? Um, I, actually, uh, so, I, so I agree, and my life has been an, a, like a, a, a real demonstration of the, the struggle to find roles. One, uh, after, I've not had one of those careers that's just settled into one thing and just done mm -hmm. the same kind of thing through levels and ultimately retired, and got a watch at the age of 40. Um, the idea of finding roles in life, so as we become adults, finding roles where we're useful to other people. We're doing something we can do and we're willing to do that's useful to other people. I think is a good piece of guidance when you're in that situation of repeatedly having to find somewhere to fit in where you can earn a living. I've certainly had to do that many times. Um, and I think as I've focused more on trying to be useful to people, it has become a little bit easier. But I love that point and I, I will try to reflect it in the somewhere. Um, I've got a question from Amy up in St. Daniels. Um, just addressing the knowledge advantage and whether the knowledge advantage of middle income professionals over children of working class parents, is that something which is real and is it something which your proposals might seek to address? Uh, firstly, I suppose that uh, I'm going to, I'm in danger of forgetting the two questions because it was two, wasn't it? The first is, is the knowledge advantage of middle class, is that real? Um, I guess it must be, mustn't it? I, I, I feel that uh, certain that I've given better advice to my sons than I would have done if I hadn't that had the, the experience of being a university graduate, if I hadn't done professional education and so on. Uh, that's got to be true. Mm. And was the second question, do any of my proposals address this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, well, one of the one of the findings that you typically see with education is that it is the children of less educated, uh, less wealthy families who benefit the most from being in school mm. um, and who conversely suffer the most from the summer holiday, for example. They will tend to fall back more than the children of, uh, of other families. Um, so I guess, yes, if the school, do, if schools do more, then less is necessary from the parents and that will slightly close the gap. Uh, young people whose parents don't give the best advice, if they get it from school instead, will to some extent get some compensation. Yeah, um, Peter Koenig follows this up and he's done some research in this area um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and he says in his, uh, so, uh, sorry, but 40 years, um, he says everyone with very few exceptions in his uh, research has, receives conditioning about money from their parents um, and teachers in school, university, etc. Um, you know, add, add to that. Um, but is, what that 
teaching, that formal education about finance is quite often insufficient to dislodge the conditioning they receive from their parents. Um, and this is true actually of many other things uh, in, in school. Um, and he thinks an entirely different approach is needed. Um, he says it's probably beyond the scope of the session, but I can put you in touch with Peter afterwards because it sounds like there's a conversation which needed, needs to be had. Yes, it sounds like a genuine expert was in our audience this morning. So uh, yes, please make uh, contact. If when, when he says that an entirely different approach is needed, is that to what's currently done or to what I've just suggested? Um, that, I think that's a question for the follow-up. Um, okay. so, um, but I think that that question of how do you uh, address um, you know, the, the conditioning by parents through education, which is not just a matter actually for, for this topic, but it covers a whole load of uh, issues around education. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the word conditioning. I appreciate that that I, I, I sort of get the connotation to that, but I obviously don't think that what schools do or what actually parents do when they talk about money in the economy, I don't think that should be conditioning. I think it should be factual and true and fair, uh, which is a little bit of a different thing. Conditioning is I'm going to reward you if you give the right responses to the stimuli, and I'm going to punish you if you don't. Um, I think that we can't insist that people agree on what is the best way to behave, but we can explain to them why particular courses of action are likely to be better for them and for others. Thank you. And Peter kind of um, said that his thoughts about uh, doing things differently is both to what's currently done and he thinks to uh, some, of the, some of your proposals. <laughs> I can feel a conversation coming on uh, between the two of you. Um, Jonathan Brills just commented that 22 states in the US have made financial literacy a compulsory half credit um, in, in high school. So it's, uh, it's an interesting point. Um, and John Hunter says you know, he finds your ideas very interesting. Um, and just wonders what relevance um, you believe that this has to uh, children outside um, outside the, you know, the, the top of top achievers, um, and should the focus be you know, throughout the curriculum for all all attainment levels? Uh, I, w I was certainly thinking of all attainment levels. Uh, in one of the things with when when you look at kids who are really smart, uh, they just seem to survive even very poor teaching. They survive not being told about things. They just um, I, I've got three sons and two of them would definitely count as uh, gifted or right on the borderline of gifted and they just seem to become experts out of nowhere. I don't know how they do it. Uh, so for them the quality of teaching and what's exactly on the syllabus is not as important but for most people it's much more important. The quality of the teaching and what's told to them, yeah. Um, and I guess finally, you sort of mentioned in your presentation that teaching children how to participate in the economy, how uh, cooperation works, how this all does, uh, should improve the performance of the economy. And I'm just wondering, can you give any illustrations or examples that might illustrate why you think that's the case? I, I can. How much time have we got, Mike? Oh, we've got another five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Oh, I'll get into this. This is one of the most interesting areas. I, I didn't say much about it today, but... Uh, I've been adding to the to the to the paper a lot recently on this, and uh, so so some examples to illustrate this idea. Let's take shopping around. It's good for the individual, obviously, if you, if you shop around because you might get a better deal, and so that's a direct motive for shopping around. But also, if you shop around, you're contributing to the functioning of your of our economy. You're doing your fair share, if you like, of the decision, the economic decision making. If we didn't, if, if too many people just bought the most obvious brand, then those brands would escape the pressure to innovate and to improve. Whereas companies that have innovated and improved, they would uh, perhaps struggle to grow as fast as they should do. Um, so shopping, at, so I think sometimes when I'm thinking about, do I want to make the effort to shop around? I think, well, I might get a better deal, but I also think, I feel I kind of have a duty to do this. The, the complement of that is factual, um, informative sales messaging. So if you want to sell stuff, then giving factual, detailed information that helps buyers make a wise decision. It's actually quite a good strategy for you personally, because it's quite an effective and efficient way to sell, but it also, of course, facilitates wise decisions by in, in the economy. Another one would be investment. 
invest in your savings. Um, ideally, you would do this after thinking seriously about economies and companies and trends and all the rest of it, fundamental analysis, or, or you would pay somebody to do that on your behalf. Conversely, if too many of us just bought trackers and just tried to react to prices, then there's a risk, isn't there, that market prices would become dissociated from reality with the occasional crash and then all the consequences of that. So us doing our fair share of the economic thinking work contributes to having better markets as well. If we're careful with real resources, if I don't use, if I don't waste real resources, then there's more for other people. Uh, career choices. I was astonished to find that there are 360,000 nurses roughly employed by the NHS. That's maybe from a couple of years ago. But at the same time, there were about 400,000 people employed in the weddings industry and only 5,500 installing solar panels. Does this make sense? Are people choosing careers that are actually what we really need? Um, if a person does choose a career that's doing something that people need and it's one of those fundamental needs, um, I think their career is likely to be more reliable and keep going through the occasional crash. Um, I have done a, supervised a couple of studies looking at this, and it is interesting. There's a slight advantage to being employed by a company that provides for the basics. And of course, if you worked in, say, the betting industry, there's always the chance that your whole industry might be regulated out of existence. There's also ownership of, of assets that benefit uh, other people. So some of the world's wealthiest people are that wealthy, at least on paper, because they own companies or land or buildings. And they've actually looked after them quite well. Uh, for the benefit of all the people that use them. And so on paper, they're wealthy. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've got piles of cash or that they live an extravagant lifestyle, though, of course, some of them do. Um, but looking after assets that other people use and benefit from is uh, another example. And the last but not least is cooperation. So when we go into economic relationships to be uh, looking for long-term cooperation with people, that's beneficial usually for us, even though, of course, we're shopping around. It's beneficial for us as suppliers. We get repeat sales. As buyers, we have a solid, reliable supplier who's good value that we can just keep going back to. If instead uh, we try to exploit people, if we try to rip them off by just exploiting their ignorance or their trusting nature or their temporary de desperation, we will struggle ourselves because it won't be long before we, we – because we're always trying to find the next sucker. And it won't be long before our reputation catches up with us and we'll begin to struggle. I was amazed to learn that on eBay now, not only do you rate products and sellers, but the buyers are rated too. So you can get a reputation for being an awkward buyer and then struggle to sell, which I find quite extraordinary. So those are a number of reasons, that's examples of why being a good citizen and looking after your selfish interests, the two things uh, give us two motives. And I suppose you could say it's either selfish, uh, it's either altruism or enlightened self-interest. But when we're aware of the contribution of our own behaviours to the common good, I think that that reinforces good behaviour. Super. And a couple of comments. Charles Henderson has referred to um, Honest Money Now, which is developed by the UK Shareholders Association. Um, and he said it would be interesting to know what you think is that learning resource. And again, that's one where I think I, I will connect you with with those who've asked questions and comments uh, after the event um, so that you can take a look. Um, I'll have to look. I know that the FS Club does a lot of events which are about the role of uh, financial markets in backing things that need to happen in our society, backing good things. And that's uh, certainly a thing. A, a lot more people need to know about that, that that goes on, that there are people who want to do that. Um, and so you know, I'll, I'll put you in touch with, with Charles as well um, after the event. Uh, the, the, the other comment, just as we're coming to a close, um, is that I used to work once in further education policy, and there was a whole you know, political view that we were training too many hairdressers um, for, the, for the economy until someone pointed out that they'd never met an unemployed hairdresser. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people make decisions about their, you know, their work and their employment and their training, uh, which, which can, can be trusted on the whole. So we, we are coming to an end. Uh, round of thanks again, first of all, uh, to our sponsors I mentioned before, but it uh, really does help us um, in the running such fascinating series uh, of webinars. Uh, and we're moving forward um, into forthcoming events. Um, tomorrow, economic lessons from the J value for the COVID response, just an interesting take on 
uh, how you can look at um, the economics of uh, lockdowns and the various responses to COVID. Next Monday, the false narrative that offshore finance is a cause of widening inequality, inequality in the UK. Uh, on Wednesday the 19th, um, a, a session on strategy, how to uh, put the strategy in place and how to uh, put it in action. Um, but finally, my thanks uh, to you all uh, for attending and for your um, contributions through the, the question session. Um, I will be putting uh, Matthew in touch with all of those who uh, ask comments, uh, ask questions, make comments, uh, so the conversation uh, can continue. Um, and a huge thanks to Matthew for um, the thinking you've been doing and for coming and sharing that with us today. Uh, we can't offer you um, a round of applause online, um, but the, the thanks is no less uh, genuine and heartfelt. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and we'll see you all uh, at a future event. Thank you very much. <laughs>